All right, we're going to move on with our agenda and get our first speaker up here. Um, our first speaker, uh, for over 35 years, Jim Feldman has helped many of the world's best managed organizations discover opportunities, thrive on change, enhance leadership and customer service skills, and counseled on new products, markets, enterprises for companies such as Apple, Toyota, Xerox, Ritz-Carlton, and many others. He's the author of six books, invented dozens of products, created groundbreaking processes. Jim has authored over 300 articles and is a frequent resource for radio, television, and newspaper interviews. He's a successful business owner that provides products and services to customers worldwide. Jim is an innovation facilitator that helps companies find new opportunities in changing world. In addition, Jim is, is an artisan chocolatier, and we had to sample some of his chocolate last night, I'll tell you. It was very good. Uh, he believes shift happens to all of us, and we should seize tomorrow. Please welcome the bright idea guy, Jim Feldman. And they say you don't tug on Superman's cake. You Come on, stand up. Let's get some energy in the room. You don't pull Everybody up on their feet. Come on. Ranger, and you Come on, get up. Come on, get up. Put your hands together, locking your fingers together. One thumb is on top. For those of you who remember, this is like praying or begging for business, whatever comes first. One thumb is on top. How many have your right thumb on top? Say aye. aye. How many have your left thumb on top? Say aye. aye. Seems like the lefts have it, right? Let's try it again. Right. Aye. Left. Fair enough, it's left. On the count of three, throw your arms apart. Break. On the count of three. Uh huh. Okay. On the count of three, you're going to throw your arms apart and put them back together, but your other thumb on top. One, two, three. Do it. I'll wait. Comfortable? Easy? How many said yeah? How many said tough? How many can't make up their mind? Okay. We don't like change, do we? It's a little uncomfortable. Let's make it a bigger change. Fold your arms in front of you like this. That's the way most of you look like in an audience. Notice on top. One arm is on top. Your left or your right. How many have their left on top? Say aye. aye. How many have their right on top? Say aye. aye. So once again, the left thumb and the left arm seem to be prevalent. Fair enough? On the count of three, throw your arms apart. On the count of three. It's going to be a long morning. I can see this coming. On the count of three, you're going to throw your arms apart and put the other arm on top. One, two, three. Everybody there? Some still working on it? How tough was that? Very. It's because it's a bigger problem. The bigger the problem of change, the more resistant we are to it. Give yourself a hand for, and please sit down and get ready for a ride. Okay. The first thing that I always want to know when I'm listening to a speaker is, why do I care? When I was seven years old, I went to my parents and I said, I want an allowance. My parents said, why would we give you an allowance? You can work like everybody else. I said, what do you want me to do? They said, well, you can mow the yard, you can wash the car, you can open up a lemonade stand. I lived in an area where a lot of professional people lived. My father was a doctor. And I went outside, and all of the doctor's kids were outside with their lemonade stands. Dozens of kids at the end of the driveway selling lemonade. It's 105 degrees outside. I went back inside and decided the lemonade stand business was not for me. But I saw an opportunity. And I went back to the room and I thought about it and thought about it. And this is where my mother takes over telling the story. She says, Jim came out and he asked to go to Shopper's World, sort of a Costco or a Walmart of its day. And we went and he immediately abandoned me. He disappeared. And about 20 minutes later, we caught up. He didn't say anything to me. And I said, what have you been doing? And he goes, I've been pricing out bulk lemonade, bulk sugar, and bulk paper cups. 
My mother had no idea what I was doing until I explained I was going to make lemonade kits and sell them to the mothers for their kids who were sitting outside in the sweltering heat. And I could go sell it at night when it was cool. And I was the only one out there selling the lemonade kits. As a result, seven years old, at the end of the summer, I had $352 in my bank account. And I have been selling stuff since. I have a difficult time accepting status quo. I look at everything and ask questions. I look at everything and try to figure out a different way of doing it. Now, I started in your business. Basically, I created slides for carousel projectors. That eventually got me a Forox and an Oxberry. Ultimately, that became something that you could use stacks of projectors, for those of you that are as old as I am. And it animated because it took one second for the slide to drop, come back up, rotate the tray, and drop down. But a stack of three would therefore give you enough that by the time the bottom one was done, the top one had already recycled. But the generation of the slides was film and masking. And then a company called Genographics came out, and it was the first computer way to generate slides. Having owned all this equipment, I understand about the capital expenditures. I understand about the technology changes. But what changed it for me was when I had created this 15 projector slideshow for a client, and he got snowed in and couldn't come down to Champaign, Illinois to do his presentation. And they were going to cancel the meeting. And I went to the meeting planner and I said, I can do this. And they said, what do you know about tires? I said, nothing but I know everything about this speech, and I can do it. And I delivered the speech, and I've been speaking ever since. I still create my own PowerPoints and slides. I still keep track of the technology, and I still enjoy doing what you do, which is finding how technology impacts my life, my clients, and my presentations. What really happens to all of us is shift happens. And whether we like it or not, shift takes place in everything we do. So today, I want you to think about something a little different. And I refer to it as thinking inside the box. Inside the box requires us to investigate, to innovate, and to initiate. Our problem today is that we have spent most of our adult lives thinking outside the box. The problem is inside the box. And if we don't go inside the box, we have no idea what the problem is. So we spend all of our waking hours coming up with these marvelous solutions to the wrong problem. As I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of the shakers and movers here today, which is pretty much all of you, I started to get a sense of some of the issues and problems that you're facing. And I said, well, let's generate some ideas. Let's take the experts in this room and come up with a thought bank. Let's do an idea exchange. And you will see on your table pieces of paper that have light bulbs. If everyone would just take one of those and put it in front of them for the time being. I just want you to look at it for a second. What we're going to do is we're going to generate ideas in the short time I have here today. We're going to talk about what keeps you awake at night. We're going to talk about what would be the aha moments that we could get from our time here today. Why do you need more innovation? Because believe it or not, that's what you are offering. That's what you are renting. It is the newest, latest, greatest, because people like the wow factor and the ease factor and the audience engagement factor of everything that goes on in this business. This is a 
full-page ad that General Electric took out. Now, it's not real important what all the copy says underneath, but the lines and the numbers. What's the impact of innovation? It affects competition. It provides us tools. It helps us partner with technology. And it improves lives. And what drives innovation is a theme and a signal that the world is changing. Look, I know I may not be your first choice on how you spend a nice day in Dallas. So my goal here today is to recognize the fact that you are experts in what you do. And I'm just going to ask a lot of questions. I'm going to get in your face. I'm going to challenge your assumptions. And hopefully, at the end of their time today, I'm going to get you thinking differently about your business, about your future, and about why you're doing things the way you're doing them. I'm going to ask you to listen to what I say next. Please, don't let what you think you know get in the way of what you need to know. If you are in the rental business, and that's the business you believe you're in, you have one thing to offer, and that's price. Because everything defaults to price. And everybody in this room can price out a job lower than the next guy. If all you're offering your customers is the lowest price, you can't make enough money to stay in business. With the capital expenditures, with the cost of employees, with all the ancillary costs of running a business, your margins continue to erode when you continue to drop prices. Let's say you wake up tomorrow morning and your tooth hurts right here. And you think you have a cavity. So you call the dentist and you say, I'd like to make an appointment. I believe I have a cavity. You go in, the dentist says, what's going on? And here, right here. Takes a look and he says, yep, it's a cavity. It'll be $50 to do the filling. You go, great. Do you want it to hurt or do you not want it to hurt? Oh, I don't want it to hurt. It's $100 for the anesthesia. Now we're at $150. Anybody going to debate that extra 100 No. Now when I give you the shot of Novocaine, that hurts. Would you like me to numb the area before you get the shot? Yes, well, that's $10. OK. Would you like some music with that so you don't hear the drilling? Well, that'd be nice. That's another $10. We pay to erase discomfort. And we are willing to pay more to make us feel comfortable, safe, and secure. When you are the low-cost provider, they still expect all that security, all that comfort, all those things, but you can't afford to give it to them. You can't bring in redundancy. You can't do all those things that are needed for change in the coming decade. Innovation is the watchword for 2013. In a very large poll, 70% of companies across the United States said that innovation leads to a competitive edge. But if you use innovation by itself, in other words, one of your vendors has come up with some new widget, new gadget, new software, everybody has access to it. What you need to do is be the expert at applying that innovation to the benefit of the customers. And the second part of this is that most companies, while they believe in innovation, focus on maintaining the status quo. Status quo to me is business as usual. Business as usual and innovation don't work together. Why? Because innovation by its very nature is disruptive. So what I do is I create collisions. 
I go into companies and I force them into driving two opposing forces to allow innovation to come into being. So here's how I'm going to change the world. It's really quite simple. To change the world, I'm going to go inside the box. But to do that, we have to meet outside the box. That's what we're doing here today. We're outside the box. Outside the box, you can take a global view, a wide perspective. But when you go inside the box, when you're inside the box, then you start to look at the problem, break it into components, and come up with solutions. Let me show you how that works. I refer to this as 3D thinking. The pyramids are three-sided. 3D thinking is three-sided. Depth, going inside the box. Inside the box, you can get a 360 degree look at the environment, at your competition. And outside the box, you decide if you're determined enough to take that solution out to the rest of the world. Let me break it down for you a little better. There's your box. When we go inside the box, we can identify the problem. How do you identify the problem? You break up the components. Years and years ago, a company came out with an electric screwdriver. Small motor, turned the screw. Somebody else looked at that and said, well, but there's only one drill bit, one screw bit. We need to have a Phillips, we need to have a flathead. So they came up with one that turned around. One was Phillips, one was flat. Somebody else looked at that and said, you know, it's really an electric drill, so why don't we put a drill bit in it, and now we've got a drill and a screwdriver. Somebody else looked at it and said, you know, guys, it's just a motor. Why don't we put other attachments on it, like saws or sanding disks? And an entirely different industry looked at that process and said, why don't we bring it into the kitchen? We'll take a motor. We'll turn it upright, and we'll put cutting blades, mixing blades, shredding blades, and we're going to call it Cuisinart. And Cuisinart revolutionized the kitchen industry, looking at what they learned from carpenters and other laborers. When you look inside the box, you do the investigation, and part of the investigation is to go outside your industry. I'm privileged to talk to lots of different organizations throughout the world. I get to see inside, or as my friends say, Jim gets to go behind the curtain and see what keeps people up at night, see where the problems lie. I recently did an event for the Cremation Association. It was a dead giveaway, what I was going to talk about. Had to go there, right? And I said to them, what's your biggest problem? And they said, there's a difference between pre-need and at-need. What does that mean? Pre-need is when you're still alive and you plan for your funeral and your disposition. At need is you've already passed and somebody else is making those decisions. And I go, that's simple. You ramp up the pre-need because at need is basically real time and pre-need obviously gives people an opportunity to make decisions. Apply that same procedure to your industry. You know that people are planning annual events. You know that Coldplay is going out on tour. You know that a speaker is coming into town. Why? Because they've been promoting it for a year. Those are what I call pre-need. You go out and pre-sell them on your expertise. At-need is when they come to you and say, here's an RFP, and it's going to go to the low-cost bidder. My business stopped filling out RFPs over 30 years ago, and I'm going to show you why. There's no way you can make money filling out RFPs. RFPs, by their very nature, are looking for the lowest cost, 
highest value, and it only benefits the individual or the company or the organization that's sending it out. Once you start to look at other industries and see how they're functioning, once you start to break up the problem into components, once you've identified what the real problems are, you can now come outside the box because you've gone in depth to the problem. And once you've gone in depth to the problem, then you come out and you do implementation and impact, meaning how are we going to make money? I want you to write this down because this could change your business. Innovation is how we make money from creativity. If you are merely renting equipment, you are not bringing creativity or innovation. And therefore, people won't pay for it. My goal today is to help you realize another 5, 8, 10, 12 percent net profit out of your business by looking at what you bring to the table and not responding to the RFP as written, but rewriting the RFP so only you can become the sole provider. Once you've gone that distance, once you've gone inside the box, once you've done the 3D thinking, we run into the really the biggest problem, and that is, what is your determination? Are you willing to make the investment? Do you have salespeople? Do you go out and act proactively in the pre-need? When I did the meetings, as it turned out, for the cremation, the funeral industry, I'd say to everyone, it appears that pre-need is the answer. We agree. Everyone in the room is in the funeral business of some sort. How many of you personally, I asked the audience, have done your own pre-need? Less than 5%. How can you sell something that you yourself don't believe in or haven't taken the time to investigate? And I'm asking you the same question. If you're waiting for the orders to come in, then you become the low-cost provider. If you go out and explain the technology, explain the benefits, you can charge what you want. There is no business today that can survive on being the low-cost provider. You're competing with yourself. People will call me up and say, we can't afford your fee for speaking. I go, you don't know what I charge. Well, we already know. You've got six books, and you're well-published, and you're this. And I said, but we haven't even talked about your objectives. At what point... Is it worth bringing in the lowest cost speaker to talk to you for 90 minutes and you go back and say, what a waste of time. It was an insult to my intelligence. The same thing happens when you bring in something and that event doesn't go flawlessly. You get blamed. If you're going to get the blame, you should also get the revenue because you need to champion your own creativity. You need to be inside that box so that you can go outside and charge for it. You are experts at what you do. Typically, the person sending you the RFP is not. They are filling out papers and sending them out. I refer to it as duck hunting with a machine gun. You send enough bullets in the air, you're bound to hit something. Think about this. When we, most of us, started in business, we started with the technical side, the quality, the Six Sigmas, etc. And then we started talking about the leadership skills of the organization. And then we talked about learning skills. How are we going to do this? Suddenly there's things called webinars and ebooks, etc. But today, all of that comes to that same triangle that I refer to as innovation. Innovation, by its very nature, is disruption. And that disruption 
is how you're going to make money. For you guys, for you here, I believe all of these words help me support the reason that you need to be more innovative. Low-cost providers don't do any of these things. Low-cost providers stay awake at night because they're not making enough money to take care of their capital investment, to take care of their overhead. Many of the people I interviewed that I talked to said, you know, I could put my money into CDs or stocks or mutual funds and get a greater return on my investment. Think about that. You buy the $10,000 big screen TV and you have to charge $1,000 a day in rental. Six months from now, that TV is $5,000 and your competition is renting it for $500. That's a real world issue. How do you cope with it? How do you get your money back being an early adopter when other people will sit and wait and then ultimately undercut you? And the answer, once again, is what you're doing with that technology that nobody else knows how to use. Three weeks ago, I was at a meeting where they introduced polling to the audience. I was fascinated by it. I got excited about it. I said, this is totally cool. I'm going to bring it to the Infocom meeting. And then I realized, you guys knew this. And while it was new to me, it's obviously not new to you. And then I started thinking about it from my perspective. And I said, if everybody's playing with this device, they're not listening to me. They're not looking about what I'm talking about. So I've created my own distractions. And am I really in the survey business, or am I in the business of helping you see things through my perspective and taking a different look at your own business to change, to grow, to add profit, etc.? At the end of the day, guys, everything is about you and never about me, never about the technology, never about the changes. You have to invent your own future. One of my clients was Apple Computer, when Steve Jobs was first there. And his organization, like what we were doing, they sent us to Microsoft. And we helped launch Microsoft Works, which you would now know as Office. And we brought to them a proposal on how we wanted to launch it, how we wanted to have events around the country, how we were going to bring Bill Gates to these events, and we gave them this budget. And the budget was pretty substantial. And the product manager looked at me and he said, who do you think we are? Apple? Today, Apple is the golden child. Today, Apple is talked about you read about, you think about more than you think about Microsoft. Microsoft has lost its way. If you go in the back of the room, every piece of equipment back there is Mac. There isn't a PC to be found unless they've got it hidden under the desk. And yet when you still go into businesses, businesses, you'll find PCs are still prevalent because people don't want to admit that there's a fun factor. Somebody talks about a Mac as if it's a toy, as if it's something they want to get back to. Somebody talks about a PC as if it's a burden. It's something you want to get away from. Apple sells relationships. Apple makes it fun. In the meeting I had with Bill Gates, personally with Bill Gates, he said this to me. Every product we make will be obsolete in two years. The only question is, who's going to make the new products? Think about it. Cell phones started off big, and the goal was to make them smaller, 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 smaller. Then they became smart, and they had apps, and they had keyboards, and now the goal is to make them bigger, 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 bigger. You're now seeing the Samsungs and some of these others that look like mini tablets strapped to your belt like it's a, a Western gun. Where before it was small, now it's getting bigger. 
Technology needs the room, but mark my words, technology is going to level off when they can figure out where the keyboard fits in. In the hotel room, if you picked up the remote control and turned it over, it had a keyboard for the internet. First time I've seen that. Brilliant. Brilliant way to marry the technology. One side is the standard volume, channels, etc. The other side allows you to play games and surf the internet. A very, very good use of technology. But are you ready for change? Are you ready to leave here today with your eyes open and abandon some of the we've always done it this way and take some of the risk and say, I want to get there. I want to move forward. I want to try some things and see if the big guy on the stage was right. I can make more money. You're talking to somebody who has gone through his own personal changes. In 2002, I was a little shy of 500 pounds. I was a walking time bomb. I went in for my annual physical. Doctor looks at me. He says, you look like crap. I said, you went to medical school for that diagnosis? I said, I haven't even gotten undressed. He goes, hey, have we ever done a stress test? I said, I'm stressed right now. He says, we should do a stress test. Well, for those of you that have never done a stress test, where they put you on the treadmill and you start walking, and you've kind of gone, well, this is no big deal. And then they start making a little faster, and then it starts going uphill. And there's a woman over there, typically a technician who's reading this thing, and suddenly there's two people reading this thing. And you're looking over, and suddenly there's four people reading this thing. And then everybody in the room is reading this thing, shaking their heads. And I'm going as fast as I can, and they're shaking their heads. And we don't like what we see. <sighs> really? I didn't like it either. Sit down. They sit me down. They say, Jim, we are going to have to do an angiogram. Really? What's that? No big deal. We're just going to check things out because we don't like what we see. Okay. Come in tomorrow, you're going to be prepped for it. For those of you who have never had an angiogram, that's where they take a rod that starts in the back of that room. <clears throat> they put it in your groin and run it up to your heart. Now, being the A-type personality, I'm going, fellas, there's got to be a shorter way to do this. They come back with the pictures and they say, this one's been scarred over since you've been two, three, so it has no blood flow at all. This one is occluded 97, 98%, which means you're getting 2% of the blood flow. And the other one's carrying everything. So Monday, we're going to do a triple bypass. I looked at these guys. I said, I wasn't in the meeting. I, I was feeling fine till two days ago. You go home and think about it. We're going to schedule you for Monday. Saturday night, an elephant sits on my chest. I call 911. Now, I happen to live in a high rise in Chicago on the 66th floor. The fire department is in my apartment within two minutes. Being the A-type personality, how'd you guys get here? Lay down, Mr. Feldman. How did you guys get here? Lay down, Mr. Feldman. I'm not laying down. Do you guys tell me how you got here? Fine. We were on the 68th floor, got the call, and we walked down two flights of stairs. That's when I got religion. I knew that somebody was looking out for me. I go to the hospital. The doctor comes in in the morning and says, guess what? You didn't have a heart attack. I go, fine, I'm going home. He goes, uh-uh, not so fast. Nothing has changed. You just didn't have a heart attack. And I said, well, what are my options? You don't have any. Sure we do. Remember. They're the experts, but at the end of the day, it's my decision. I said, I'd like, to, I'd like you to clean me up. I understand there's a roto-rooter process. He goes, that's not what we call it. It's an angioplasty where we just go in and clean things out. I said, I'll take one. You don't have a choice. Yes, we do. Now, here's the point that people are either going to like or not like. I spent the rest of that day in the hospital negotiating with everyone that walked in the room. I want the angioplasty. 
I want you to agree to do this. The first person who walks in is the scheduling nurse. And I said, hi, how are you? I'm Jim. How are you doing? She goes, great. I said, uh, what time should we schedule my procedure tomorrow? She goes, you have no choice. Computer puts in the social security numbers. It generates everybody's name and number, and that's how it's done. I said, if I was your husband, brother, lover, best friend, what time would you want me to go in? She goes, you don't have any choice. I said, we all have choices. If I was, she goes, okay, one o'clock. I go, why? She goes, because it's Monday. Why? Because the doctors will be coming back from lunch at one o'clock, and that leaves the whole afternoon in case something goes wrong. What could go wrong? Oh, honey, you don't want to know about that. I said, so one o'clock it is. She goes, yep, yeah, that's what it should be. I said, I'll take it. She goes, I'm going to have your hearing checked while you're here because apparently you don't understand. You have no choice. I go, let's start all over. I'm in the motivation business. I'm in the incentive business. What would it take for you to put me in at 1 o'clock? She goes, like what? I said, mm, chocolate, wine, cigars, nylons, scarves. Stop me when I got something you like. She goes, what kind of chocolate? I said, how about Ghirardelli? She goes, how much? I said, 10 pounds? She goes, they don't make a 10-pound bar. I go, yeah, they do for me. I have a contract with Ghirardelli. They make a 10-pound bar of chocolate. Get out of town. I'm planning to get out of town right after I leave here. I want to have the angioplasty. She goes, when do I get the bar of chocolate? I said, as soon as you schedule me. She goes, give me five minutes. Disappears, comes back. She says, one o'clock it is. One for me. Next nurse comes in. She goes, I don't like chocolate. I said, who are you? She goes, I'm the happy nurse. I said, you don't seem very happy. She goes, I'm the one that's going to give you your medication to make you feel good. I don't like chocolate. I said, what do you like? She goes, what's the list? We started going through it. She goes, cigars? What kind of cigars? I said, I'm in the cardiac ward and I'm getting rid of chocolate and cigars. You guys don't buy into this program. She goes, don't lecture me. What kind of cigars? I said, oh, I got Cubans, I got this. She goes, hold on. She gets on the phone. She's talking to somebody. She says, he wants to talk to you. Yes? Oh, you've been married to her for how long? Yeah, my condolences. Okay, so how are we going to work this out? Yes, I have Cubans. Yes, I have Churchills. Yes, I have Cohibas. Yes, I'll tell her. He wants to talk to you. Really? 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 Okay, she goes, take these pills. I said, what that? She says, he said to start making you happy right now. Before the day was over, I had negotiated with the surgeon, with the anesthesiologist, with the recovery room nurse, everything because I had one singular focus. Now we come to the end of the day, and in comes a gentleman, white gown. It says, Dr. Giorgiotti, department head, cardiology. And he picks up the chart, and this is what you just love about doctors. He's talking like I'm not in the room. Morbidly obese, 56-year-old patient presents himself. I'm going, hello, I'm in the room. I'd prefer not to be called morbidly obese. He goes, well, you are. I go, I'd prefer not to be called that. He goes, listen, you need to change your lifestyle. I said, I got that. I got that. He says, who's your cardiologist? You are. He says, no, no, no. no. I said, you are. He goes, you don't understand. I'm the head of cardiology. I said, that's why I want you because you're the head of cardiology. Now I'm telling you these stories because we all have the ability to ask questions and to interact. And I said, as head of cardiology, what does that mean? He said, well, I'm in a teaching hospital and all of these are my residents and I go all over the world and lecture on cardiology. I said, oh, when you fly, do you have elite status? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, are you a platinum? Are you a premier? All these things. He goes, no, because I'm not often on the same airline. I oh. So then when you get to wherever you're going, you probably don't have elite status with the hotel. He goes, no. I said, well, would that matter? And I said, well, wouldn't you like to check in at the front of the line? Wouldn't you like to be upgraded? He goes, where are you going with this? And I said, well, I wrote a book called Dr. Travel's Cure for the Common Trip. And every one of you have got a copy of that with my compliments. It's a book on travel tips. And I said to him, in writing the book, I've done work with Hyatt and Marriott and United and American, and I can get you elite status. 
He says, how would you do that? I said, I pick up the phone right after you fill in that page where you say you're my cardiologist. He says, how do I know you're going to do that? I said, you can always erase yours. I'll get yours right now. He writes it down. I pick up the phone. I call David Riddell, Senior Vice President at Marriott Hotel. David, how are you? Great. David, listen, I'm in the hospital, and they want to do a triple bypass, and I'm trying to talk my way out of it. And to do that, I'm going to need you to upgrade the head of cardiology membership in the Marriott Rewards Program. No problem, Jim. I said, he'd like to know your number. Fella gives him his Marriott number. David, on the other hand, says, I'll have the cards to you within two weeks. Please take care of my friend. If anything happens to him, you won't get your upgrade. <laughs> Every day we are faced with these challenges and opportunities. I want you to walk out of here today thinking that you are in control of your own life and your own destiny. And I want you to craft your vision. The vision for me was very simple. I didn't want to have a triple bypass. But I knew that if I didn't change my life, I was going to have a triple bypass whether I liked it or not. After they did the angioplasty, I was asked to come back six months later and take another test, another treadmill. And once again, same story. But there was only one girl the whole time. One technician until they stopped it. Dr. Giorgiotti shows up. And he's looking at the, I call it the ticker tape. And he says, what are you so happy about? I said, happy? Six months ago you guys wanted to cut me open? I just passed the test. I changed my life in six months. He goes, no. You passed the test. You didn't change your life. What do you mean? Jim, you're still overweight. You have high cholesterol. You have high blood pressure. You're a diabetic. If you don't have a stroke, if you don't have a heart attack, you are a textbook candidate for amputation and or blindness. Now, those alternatives are pretty scary. When you're talking to your customer, you can be that severe. Sure, you can go to the low-cost bidder, but without redundancy, without a tech on site, which you haven't factored into your RFP, what if something goes wrong? You only have one chance at a live event. It's got to go flawlessly. You only have one chance at life. You've got to change your life or it changes you. I said to Dr. Giorgiotti, you've for the first time told me what I needed to hear. My choices were change or change was going to be disruptive and maybe permanent. I started working out. I started eating differently. I still play with the chocolate. I still make chocolate. I just don't eat the chocolate. I've learned that my vision is that I want to be able to control my life, albeit the government keeps getting in the way and employees keep getting in the way and all kinds of other things keep getting in the way, but to my best ability, I'm in control of what I do and how I do it. And when I lost weight, I discovered I could go into a store and not go to the big and men's tall department. I discovered that I could buy clothes off the rack. I discovered that I could walk up a flight of stairs. I discovered that I could do that little routine here and not be huffing and puffing. I discovered that I could play racquetball again. I discovered that I could go swimming again because my vision changed. And when I reached out to your group, I had three people that helped guide me through this process. Don, Bob, and Cal, are you in the audience? Can you stand up, please, and be recognized? These gentlemen gave me some of their time. Are the other two fellows here? Yes. They gave me some of their time, and I want to thank them for it publicly. So if you would, Cal, would you take this and give it to the other two gentlemen? Just a small thank you inside the box. Now, I've given this envelope, let's think of it as a box. What do we know about what's inside? Anybody? What do we know about it? Then if you're thinking outside the box, what good is it? Learn from children. Don't open it yet. 
Tell me what you feel and what's inside. Gentlemen? Swag. Cool. Something's in Hello, something's in there. Thank you for that. Astute observation. A good guess would be there might be some chocolate, right? My point to all of this, guys, if this is the box, we don't know what's inside. Therefore, how can we work on a problem and a solution when we have no idea of what it is? Think about it. Are we developing a country who has forgotten how to refocus our focus? Are we a country that no longer understands that there are important forces shaping our industry? This little graph that I put up here is the combined wisdom of these three experts. This is what they believe each of you are facing. New products, new entrants, new substitutes, I was sitting at a breakfast table today where they were talking about live streaming and, and how the price of live streaming has come down and how it's going to become a fairly major competitor to the live event industry. How do you manage a live event when you've got 500 people in the room and 5,000 people on the streaming? Who's really your audience? Those are the wisdoms. Those are the things that people will pay for because they don't have the answers and you do. You have to charge for it instead of giving it away. You have to bundle instead of doing line items. You have to choose to do things differently, and you have to stop shooting all over yourself. I should have done this. I should have done that. Life is too short. From my personal perspective, I think I got an extra 25 years to get in your face. I think if I hadn't done what I had done when I did it, I wouldn't be here today. But the choice was life-threatening. Are some of your choices business life-threatening? Are you asking yourself, what if, why not, what's next? I have this taped up in my bathroom mirror. I ask myself that every single morning when I get up. What if? Why not? What's next? I tweet about it. I Facebook about it. I LinkedIn about it. I ask these questions day in and day out, and people will come back and say, well, Jim, you're just wired that way. So I had to start rethinking, how do I help educate people? A historic and unprecedented event has occurred. Fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy night. Conversation, don't you? We're going to California. So in that short history of the movies, I've given you the short history of your industry. How it's progressed from silent to talkies to digital. But if you use the movies and you think of it as something outside your industry, then what do you learn from it? Because if this is what won the Academy Award, high tech, high touch, three dimensional, remember what won next. <laughs> Don't 
the world goes full circle. You could say there's an app for that. Are you developing apps for your businesses? Are you developing uses of apps? When I started looking at the polling devices, I found out that there were apps for smartphones. Then you no longer have to introduce a second handheld device. Everybody's got their smartphone. You can incorporate that technology into what they're already doing. Look, almost anything is possible, and almost everything is available. And it's easy to be an expert in the future realm, since I, like you, have no exceptional experiences in the future, even predicting the future. But what I do understand is that we have to invent our own future. How many of you in this room use social media marketing to drive your business? How many of you encourage people in the audience to send out tweets? How many of you in the room have tweeted since I start since this meeting started? Raise your hand. I'd say 10%. 10%. How many of you in this room know how to tweet? Raise your hands. Oh goodness, we're up to about 30%. How can you sell what you don't understand or use? So ask yourself, what can be simplified, adapted, and magnified? What can we do to reach the 2.8 billion social media profiles? Ladies and gentlemen, this is part of your industry. This is part of what you have to understand. This is part of what you need to do. And it's really easy. I call it four, five, and six. Share, collaborate, and innovate. Remember the word innovate. It is the word of 2013. And I ask myself, why five times? I call it why to the power of five. And for those of you that have ever tried the why question, let me explain how it works. You start with the end. You start with something that's of interest or quizzical or puzzle, and you say, why? So here's one for you. It turns out that the solid rocket booster on arguably the most advanced transportation system in the world, the solid rocket booster, those little guys on the side, are four feet eight and a half inches wide. Now why would a rocket scientist come up with four feet, eight and a half inches wide? And when I heard this, I started asking why. Why? Well, it turns out that the solid rocket boosters are built in Utah, and they have to be put on trains and taken down to the launch site. Those trains go through tunnels, and the tunnels are about four feet, eight and a half inches wide because that's the gauge of the railroad track. Once again, four feet, eight and a half inches wide. It's an odd, odd number. So I asked why? Well, because the railroads in the United States were built to that specification. Once again, why? Well, because the railroads were built by the English. That's swell. Why did the English build them like that? Well, the English built them like that because when they brought over the wagons that they used to haul the equipment, the wheel spacing on the wagon was four feet, eight and a half inches wide. Well, there comes another why. Why did they build the covered wagon four feet, eight and a half inches wide? Well, because the wheels had to fit in the ruts of the road in England. Once again, why? Because the roads were built by the Romans. Oh, okay, why did the Romans have ruts that were four feet, eight and a half inches wide? Because the Romans used chariots to build the roads. Once again, why? because the chariots were pulled by two horses. Okay, 
We got two horses pulling the chariots that built the roads, that caused the ruts, to build the wagons. The wagons had to come over, and that's why the railroad was four feet, eight and a half inches wide. Why? Because as it turns out, the width of two horses' butts is four feet, eight and a half inches wide. Ladies and gentlemen, the most advanced transportation system in the world was constrained by the width of two horses' butts. So I ask you, what horse's butt in your organization is stopping your progress? Who is the person or persons that aren't allowing innovation to take place? Because at the end of the day, that's why. We stop progress ourselves, and as a result, the solid rocket booster size was controlled by the Romans because change was never questioned as history moved forward. I said before, that is the right solution to the wrong problem. Identify the problem first, and then come up with the solution. So, Let's talk about this very quickly, and then we're going to start doing the idea exchange. These are the types of cultures, and which one is you? Ridiculous and willing to fail? Passionate? Strong internal focus? Keep the pipeline flowing. You identify with any of those? Yes? No? If creativity is the process of developing ideas, then innovation is the process of transforming those ideas into profitable solutions. Innovation is how we make money from creativity. Look, meeting industry is slow to change. They are admired in their own silos. Their silos are so focused that no matter who you talk to, they don't have the full picture. One is trade shows, one is live events, one is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they just don't get it. You have to be quicker. You have to be smarter. And you have to decide whether you're hunting elephants or rabbits. Go for the big game. Fill out an RFP for something you don't care about, that you can do in your sleep, where all they really want to do is rent some equipment. But go for the big game where somebody says, look, I'm IBM, I put on 150 of these big meetings a year, and you're going to be my producer always. Then you become the reason that they have successful meetings. People will pay for success. People don't like failure. So we're going to question everything. So let me ask you, if you're sitting in the room and you're listening to me for the time we've had here, do you see new growth opportunities? So when everybody to take out their little light bulb piece of paper, do not write your name on it, but let's decide on a question collectively that we're all going to address. Here's a couple questions I've come up with. Strategic goals that can be accelerated, growth opportunities. How do you distinguish yourself from your competitors? I, I discovered in my quest for learning an interesting tool, and it's called a no-brainer. And a no-brainer is a little analog tool that's invented by a fellow named Gerald Heyman, and I sought him out. He spent 30 years coming up with this. He says, Jim, he says, you, Jim, don't have to think about the questions. They're hardwired. You don't have to think about the what if, the why not, but other people do. So this is a thought starter. This is questions, nouns, verbs, and visuals. And I discovered it, and I now carry it with me everywhere. So just at random, I just pulled out a question. What could be the full potential or the ROI on this decision? Why or how should solutions fail? What must be sold or persuaded to support or champion the plan? Under strategies and tactics, how am I going to train, coach, and educate my staff and my clients? 
Fun little tool. Fun way to come up with the questions that we're all talking about. So here was the question. If you were starting from scratch and there were no hindrances, no obstacles, and no limit to your resources, if anything was possible, what would your business look like? Is that a good question for this group to address? Do I have a consensus that that's a good question, or should we come up with a different one? This is where the audience responds. Anybody? Anybody got a more burning question? I kind of refined it after talking to some people yesterday, and I said, how are you working on your business differently to enhance profit and to upsell? Since all of you are concerned about the eroding margins, maybe this is the question we address. What bright idea would you like to have in your organization or get from Infocom or get from the thought leaders here to help monetize your business? Let's agree on what the question is, and then let's start free thinking some ideas. Is that a good question? Is that a good question? We okay with that? So everybody write down one idea, and let's say that we've got 50 people in the room. We've got 20-some people that are the ancillary support staff, etc. So roughly... 76 people. And by the way, the support staff can participate this, same as everybody else at the table. So this is our question. How are we working on our business differently? Again, with no constraints. If you had nothing stop from doing it, write down an idea on your light bulb. Don't put your name on it. Just write down an idea. Just let it go. Just start to let it go. Write it down. Our question again is, would everybody just write the question on the top? How are you working differently on your business to enhance profit? Or how are you enhancing profit? And if you want to talk about upsell, if you want to talk about the fact that you don't have salespeople, any of these issues are fair game. We're going to try to generate as many ideas as possible in the next 30 minutes. And then at the end of the day, I'm going to come back to you with some of the brilliant solutions we've come up with. Would everybody agree that we can generate at least one idea per person? So we should be able to get 60, 70 ideas? Please write legibly. If you can't think of anything, then do this question. What are you afraid of? and put it in the light bulb saying, I'm afraid of, maybe the answer is technology, unions, eroding profit margins. But let's focus on these two. What are you doing differently to enhance profits, to upsell? What are we afraid of? And keep writing as I, I continue talking because I'm going to give you some more triggerings. What's the most innovative practice or product that you launched in the last year? And are you making money from it? Or are you just waiting for people to ask for it? How are you selling it? What would you eliminate if you had to get rid of dead weight? Now here comes Jim in your face again. How many RFPs do you fill out versus how many do you win? Do you figure out how long it takes you to fill out an RFP in terms of real dollars? Let's say your billable rate, for simple math, is $100 an hour. And it takes you an hour to fill out an RFP. And you fill out 100 RFPs a year. 
Anybody want to do the math? Anybody? $100 an hour, 100 RFPs, so much money. How much? $10,000. Now, of those 100 RFPs, how many do you win? Let's say, for simple math again, one. Do you factor in the $10,000 that you've already invested to get that one RFP and be the low-cost bidder? And did the margins that you ended up with take into account the 10 grand you invested because you had 99 of them that went nowhere and one you won? And the answer in most conversations with most companies is, no, we don't factor that in. Now, when you get a complicated RFP that's not just pricing, but actually asking you for creative input, etc., your costs are much higher. Once again, do you analyze the number of RFPs you fill out versus the number of RFPs you get versus the bottom line profit? And the answer is typically no. So here's my takeaway for you. I'm going to do the math. An ROI on an RFP equals zip. Stop filling out RFPs and be in demand. Say to your client, we're so busy we don't have time for this because we're working with those clients that are paying for our wisdom and not just renting product. Now if your entire business is the rental business and you offer no insights, no creativity, no solutions, then I'm not talking to you because that's your business. But for the rest of us, you need to sell big ideas and charge for them. You need to be able to say, you're hiring me because I'm an expert at what I do, and this is what I get paid for it. And it's what I refer to as an aha moment. So let's just kind of go through this process. We're going to record ideas, we're going to recall the ideas, and we're going to recycle the ideas. Right now, you're recording ideas. Just keep writing as I talk. Everything that comes to mind, there's no holes barred, there's no walls, there's nothing stopping you. Just put down ideas saying, what if, what's next, what's possible? If I could change my business, if I could monetize this product, if I could be a solution provider, I'm no longer afraid of this. And we're going to record them on that piece of paper by putting one idea inside each light bulb. I want to generate as much volume and as much variety. And I want to build on ideas. And we're not judging everybody. All right, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to write, to stop writing. So. We've agreed that we're going to get at least 76 ideas. On every page, there's 12 on a page. So if you fill out both sides, that's 24 ideas to one page. I want everybody to collect their sheets and give it to one person at the table. So if everybody at this table pass it to this young lady here, pass them all to one person. OK? Everybody got them to one person? I want that one person to stand up. Just stand up for a second. Somebody want to take this gentleman's here? Just put him in the pile. OK? Now, I want everybody to go to the next table, just counterclockwise, and trade sheets. In other words, you're, everybody's going to take their sheets and give it to the table on the right. It's just going to keep moving. So you're just going to give your sheets to another table, and that table's going to give their sheets to somebody else. I want you to get so confused you have no idea whose sheets you have. So everybody gets somebody else's. Now redistribute them amongst the people at the table. If you're sheetless, somebody's coming with some more sheets. We don't want anybody sheetless. We don't want shift to happen. Guys, it's not that complicated. 
Have you got extras? <laughs> Has everybody got sheets? Anybody that doesn't have new sheets? Now look at those sheets, see if that generated any ideas for you that you can build upon. See if reading what somebody else wrote down gives you another insight that you hadn't thought of, and now generate another idea and write it on the sheet. Now generate two ideas, three ideas. Start the process again. Write as much detail as possible so others can understand it. Fill out the light bulbs as quickly as possible. Don't judge the idea, and only one idea per light bulb. So each sheet would have 12 light bulbs with 12 ideas. If you see somebody else's idea and it was the same as yours, ignore it, move on, write something else. Don't try to figure out who wrote it. If you can't think of anything, put a smiley face in the light bulb. Record funny lines, brainstorm funny ideas. There's no constraints. There's nothing holding you back. Generate as many ideas as we can possibly generate. Look, what drives innovation is disappearing trade barriers, shifts, customers, expectancies. The amazing access to information and data and the decreasing cost of entry. I was recently at a meeting with Oracle where they said two to three times the amount of data Oracle stores and everyone stores has no place to be stored because they can't accumulate the data fast enough to store it. And I asked my burning question, if you've got that much data, how do you sort through it? And Oracle's answer was, we're in the storage business, not the research business. I went to Google, and Google has come up with a search engine for businesses to search that data. And I said to Google, how do you charge for it? And I got blank stares. They said, we haven't figured it out yet. I said, so you're telling me that you can go search this massive amount of data quickly, but you don't know how to charge for it. That's correct. Why? Because that's somebody else's job. We're the technology side not the sales and marketing side. When I went to the sales and marketing guys, they didn't even know that the search guys had figured out a way to do this for private industry. And my last question to Google was, if, if I can put on my little itty bitty technology hat and, and I've got all this data, I have to upload it to your servers so you can search it. That's correct. Well, that's going to make me a little nervous to give Google all my data. Oh, don't worry, we've got all these disclaimers and non-competes. Now, if you're Marriott or Hyatt or anybody with huge amounts of data, and you give it to Google, are you going to feel comfortable that they've got it and raise their pinky finger saying we're not going to do anything with it? And Google now, in looking at that, has got to spend more time figuring out how to reassure the client that to search it, they have to have access to it, but to have access to it doesn't mean that they're going to use it for their own search engines and information. That's like saying to a kid, go into the candy store, but don't taste anything. Your mom's going to come in later and buy what she thinks you wanted. If you think about it, the kid says, no, it's for me. Google's going to say, well, we're just kind of sorting for you. We're not going to take any of that top-line information and use it for ourselves. So if you look at what drives innovation and you see all these components, to me, I'm going to break it down for you. It really comes down to this. Opportunity, identification, development, and capture. And ladies and gentlemen, that's how you should be spending your time. How do you do pre-need rather than at need? How do you go out and get business rather than waiting for business to come to you? How do you help write the RFP so that only you are the sole provider? 
If I was writing an RFP for me as a speaker, it would be, you need a guy who's gone through his own metamorphosis, he's got a beard, he's in your face, and he owns the trademark shift happens. Now go ahead and send that out to whomever you want. Pretty well narrowed it down, haven't I? There is nobody else. You can do the same thing. You can come back and you can stop the business as usual in your organization and convert it to innovation as usual. You shift from the efficiencies because these are basically your clients, your employees, and everyone in the world. And I refer to it as three to four ways of looking at the universe. Number one, those people who are unconsciously incompetent. I refer to those as the people sending out RFPs. They don't know what they don't know, and everything defaults to price. There's the conscious incompetent. They know what they don't know, and it bothers them. And so they're sort of open to listening. Every now and then you come into the conscious competence, and you know that you don't know something, and you're going to work at learning it. And then I come to you guys, because you don't give yourself enough credit. You're the unconscious competent. You've been doing this for so long, you do it in your sleep. You've forgotten more than the other three can even ask. But you don't offer it, and you don't charge for it. And often, if you do offer it, you don't charge for it. You bundle it. And people will pay for your expertise. Think of it as a closet. Is your closet cluttered? Now, I know you guys have been in business a long time, and maybe your closet looked like this. One day you went in, and you started throwing out all the old mics and the carousel projectors, etc. But at the end of the day, all of us, whether it's our personal closet or our corporate closet, only wear or use 20% 80% of the time. And that's where the business has the dividing line. If you could use 25%, 80% of the time, that extra 5% is pure profit. If you could use 20%, 90% of the time, it means you've gone out to sell. Start to change the 80-20 rule to your own benefit. If I've triggered an idea, write it down. Let's keep the ideas on the paper. We've got about 15 more minutes for you guys to keep generating simplistic, realistic, tactical, motivational solutions that we're going to share. If we're going to be innovative, we have to commit to the vision. Because the vision has to start in this room. You have to take it back. And you have to be the person who says, we're going to change, we're going to be innovative, and we're going to charge for our innovation. We understand that the real trend is disruption, and disruption is like a pebble dropping in water, sending out ripples. A disruptive solution is the pre-need, forward-thinking, going out and grabbing business as opposed to waiting for business to come to them. Think about how you reframe your corporate metaphors, because if you don't, all of this will go back and your culture will eat my strategy for breakfast. Cultures don't like disruption. Create the collision and create the change. One of the things that I love doing in a meeting is when I get everybody to stand up, I'll make them sit somewhere else when they come back. It is incredible how annoyed people get. This is my seat, this is my table, I staked it out, and now you've taken it away from me. I don't like you anymore. It wasn't your table at 8.30, it became your table at 9 o'clock. We don't like change. We didn't like folding our fingers. We didn't like crossing our arms. Imagine what happens when you go back and start to change the organization and change the way you do business. If you don't do it, the same old thinking is going to give you the same old results. 
And if you don't do it, you do do it because you haven't asked your customers what they would like. Remember, I'm in the hospital. I'm quizzing the nurses. I'm in their face. Why? Because personally, I'm the most important patient in the room. And what they do for everybody else, I don't wish them any harm, but it doesn't affect me. It's all about me, period. And it has to be about you. When you go out there and you start talking to the meeting planners, you start running into all of these issues that they don't understand innovation. But you, as a leader, need to inspire curiosity. You need to question the assumptions. And then you start moving through the lackluster ideas that they've got. You say, no, that's not going to work for you. We'd like to challenge your current perspective, but to do that, we can't fill out your RFP because you're going to want all of this as part of the RFP, and we just can't do that. Talk about top line like a car dealer. When you go into the BMW dealership, the first cars they show you is the 700 series. And when they say it's $150,000, you go, I can't afford that. Okay, we'll move you down to the 5 series, the one without the GPS, the one without the CD player, without the sunroof. Well, but I liked all that. Well, it's only available in the 7 series. Yeah, but I can't afford that. Well, we understand. So maybe we should move you down to the 3 series. Then you've got enough money to put gas in the car. No one defaults up. They come down. If you're starting at the bottom and adding, people don't like it. Start at the top and convince them why they need this product, service, wisdom, and they'll pay for it. And then when they don't want to pay for it, you remove it. And they don't want to give it up. You need to experiment with it. You need to try it. But you need to get things done if you want to change your business model, your strategy, your tactics, your objectives, and most importantly, your bottom line. It's not about revenue. It's about how much of the revenue you keep. You can be doing $100 million a year and losing money, and there's big companies out there doing it every day. Amazon loses money, Barnes and Noble loses money, blah, 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 blah. And then one day they're gone because losing money does not make you a not-for-profit company by law. It makes you a not-for-profit company because it was mismanaged. Rethink your expertise. Shift your clients from efficiency to innovation. And that unconscious incompetence will pay for your competency. You've got to work through all kinds of corporate cultures. I get it. But the biggest corporate bargains out there are the strategic alignment, i.e., we're looking out for you. We're not a one-time event company. We're your partner for the year. We understand your audience. We understand your challenges. Why would you want to re-educate somebody all the time? We own our equipment. Why would you want to bring in a rental, straight rental? We have our own techs. Why would you want to bring in freelancers? Those are real questions they can't answer. And once you've gone through that, then you start to create your own building blocks within your culture. And you start to inspire. You start to instill. You start to imagine how it looks. And once you understand what you imagine and how it looks, you ask yourself, am I really ready for the change? Am I ready to go inside the box? And can I accept failure? If you hear me say nothing else today, you must accept calculated failure. Because failure is how you learn. Failure is the cousin of success. And once it's the cousin of success, then you can start to look at change. Now, let me graph it out for you. This is what's called an infographic. This is change for climates. These are all the things you have to do for climate change. Done by a guy sitting in a three-day seminar. This was his artwork. We then did a seminar where we talked about innovation. Look how much more complicated all the changes were for innovation. More decision trees, more distances, more this, more that. 
And as I looked at it, I went back to him and I said, let you and I sit down and chat because I think we've missed something here. It's not about innovation. It's about behavior. Let's do the same infographic for behavior. Look at this one. Changing behavior is more difficult than coming up with innovation. Changing behavior is more difficult than changing the climate, putting that in perspective. Changing behavior has to start with you here, today, now. What am I going to do differently tomorrow that will get me better results than I got yesterday? Challenge the status quo. Think about what we're going to do and perhaps get one of these tools or not. But there are things out there that will help trigger the process. Again, the no-brainer has questions, it has nouns, it has all these wonderful little nomadic devices, the verbs, the quotes, and the images that stimulate various parts of your brain. It's no different than what you do in an event. To me, an event is only successful when the audience believes their time was well spent. It's got nothing to do with the lighting, with the video, with the sound. All those are givens. It's what happened. And so people have said to me, well, Jim, how do you use this? And I said, it's questions, words, quotes, images, all done in a nifty little form. And I'm only explaining this to you because people often ask, how do I come up with the questions? How do I generate the ideas? How do I look at quotes and see where they're taking me? One of my favorite quotes was, Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity, but it's the man who discovered the parking meter, the electric meter, that's making all the money. Think about it. Ben didn't make any money on his discovery, but the guy who measured it has figured out a way to monetize it. Can you do an event and say, look, everything is free. We'll get paid on the responses from the audience. If we get a 90% or better favorable rating, because we controlled the content, we controlled the event, we were basically putting our money where our mouth is. We share in the event. We share in your success. And we'll do everything to make it succeed, as opposed to just renting. Ask them lots and lots of questions. When somebody calls me up and starts saying, what's your price? My response is always, if I give you the lowest price, does that mean I get the job? Well, we haven't talked about content. You didn't ask about content. The first words out of your mouth was price. I'm asking you a question. If I give you the lowest price, am I your speaker? Well, no. Well, then price is irrelevant, isn't it? It's the outcome of the event. Now we just have to see how close we can get. I'm not saying you don't negotiate. I'm not saying you don't respond. I am saying you don't respond without making it difficult for them not to accept you as the early innovator. Write down a couple more ideas. I don't see people writing, so I'll tell you what, don't write, stop, collect the papers again. And this time, go to an entirely different table and do the exchange again. If you filled out one side, just write 12 on the bottom so we can count them up. How many people have got at least one side filled out? Raise your hands. Looks like about 10. So that's roughly 120 ideas right, right now. As fast as you can, start to generate more ideas. The value of a meeting idea today is to be able to use it. The value of what we're doing today is to tap 
the collective wisdom of everybody in the room. The value of today is to say to yourselves, what if, what's next, what's possible, and to say, what am I going to do differently tomorrow that will get me better results than I got yesterday? Everybody got sheets? If the meetings industry wants to make a major impact on conferences of the future, you need to go in new directions. You can do it strategically, you can do it tactfully, you can do it sales objectively. But no matter what, you've got to change the way you charge for your wisdoms. Ladies and gentlemen, people want the product of your product not the product itself. The product of the product is when a cardiologist says, if you don't change your life, you're a textbook candidate for amputation and or blindness. When you can have that kind of moment, that's an aha moment to the planner, where you can say to them, not choosing me and my company could jeopardize the success of this meeting. It no longer comes down to price. When you can say to them that the collective wisdom of my organization and its resources will make you look like a rock star and will deliver an experience to your audience unlike anything they've had. And when you can say that our collective wisdom will help with the content, the other resources, the planning, the preparation, because you have bundled those services as a one-stop shop. When you can say to them, I'm going to help you think differently, I'm going to help you think from the perspective of the audience and not the CFO. I'm going to help you understand that live events are meant to inject enthusiasm, challenge assumptions, and deliver the product of the product. Ladies and gentlemen, what are you going to do differently tomorrow that will get you better results than you got yesterday? If you want to send the answer to me, there's the tweet hashtag. I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm going to be here for the whole convention. I'm going to see you again at the end of the day and give you a wrap-up to the things that we've learned with the goal focused on making you uncomfortable, making you think inside the box, and making you take the decisions outside the box. There's your challenge. Are you up for it? Have a good day. Thank you.